Hello again. My name is Will Patrick. I'm a PhD candidate in the Critical Geographies Lab at the University of Victoria, which is on the territory shared by the Lakwangan and Kwasanich peoples. I'm a political geographer who studies local governance in Afghanistan, as well as monument and infrastructure conflicts in Canada and the United States. In this second session, I'm going to continue discussing the current and historical context for the crisis in Afghanistan, um, provide you with you know, some more of the complexities uh, that led to the Taliban seizing Kabul. And in particular, in this one, I'm going to focus on the responses of uh, former Soviet Central Asian states. Uh, but first, I'm going to discuss Iran and Iran's role as a donor to the Taliban, um, as well as uh, opposing the Taliban um, in the not too uh, recent history. Oh, Iran shares uh, language and culture with Afghanistan and Tajikistan. Um, Persian or Farsi in Iran is also spoken as Dari in Afghanistan or Tajiki in Tajikistan. And historically, um, Iran has supported um, Tajiks in Afghanistan, uh, whether they be Sunni or Shia, as well as Afghanistan's um, Shia minority groups, particularly the Hazaras, which are a Shia minority group located in the central highlands of Afghanistan, which have been historically uh, persecuted and subject to um, a genocide uh, during the uh, Hazara Afghan Wars. During the uh, Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan between uh, 1979 and 1989, Iran backed uh, Hazara uh, resistance groups in the Central Highlands as well as uh, Tajik uh, resistance fighters, particularly in the West. Uh, the uh, Afghan uh, Tajik warlord um, Ismail Khan, um, based out of Herat, received a lot of funding from Iran, uh, even after the Soviet uh, occupation ended. From 1996 to 2001, Iran opposed the Taliban rule. This was partially because of the Taliban's targeting of um, Shia minority groups, in particular the Hazaras, as well as the Taliban targeting uh, Iranian officials and uh, members of the Iranian uh, delegation at the embassy. Uh, the massacre of Iranian officials resulted in a very hostile response uh, and the strategy taken by Qasem Soleimani, the general of the Revolutionary Guard who was killed in a drone strike by uh, ex-president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump's supporters, uh, coordinated uh, Iranian support to the Afghan resistance out of Tajikistan. And that was between 1996 and 2001. Iran and the Revolutionary Guard actually worked alongside the United States uh, in pushing out uh, the Taliban in 2001. But this uh, relationship broke very quickly uh, when former President George W. Bush referred to Iran as part of an axis of evil. And that was quite surprising um, to the uh, Iranian government, Te Tehran, because many of Washington and Tehran's objectives, especially in the region, had aligned. Uh, so after that, Iran supported uh, its local proxies like Ismail Khan, um, and various uh, Hazara groups. But it took a step back from supporting the uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, which again, um, existed from 2004 until recently in 2021. The support for the Taliban came as recently as uh, 2015. And this support for the Taliban include funding, arming, and providing bases for training and base of operations, um, particularly out of Mashhad. This support for the Taliban was partially spurred by Iran's fear of um, Daesh, or the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, 
and the franchise in uh, Central and South Asia known as the Islamic State Khorasan province. This fear that Iran has um, and its involvement in Afghanistan also led to the creation of the Liya Fatimayun, which is a brigade of Hazara fighters, uh, which Iran sent to Syria to assist the Syrian government in its civil war. The Liya Fatimayun and Iran's involvement in it have been very criticized, especially because Iran forcibly conscripts Hazara refugees living in Iran who are very vulnerable people. After Hazaras have served in the Liya Fatimayun, usually through promises of um, becoming permanent residents or citizens of Iran, uh, they're often sent back to Afghanistan. As of late, uh, Iranian media, uh, in response in some ways to uh, Iran being referred to as the axis of evil, has taken up this term axis of resistance. And the axis of resistance is specifically those states that Iranian media and some officials see as combating the United States. Um, and recently, some Iranian media has referred to as the Taliban and the second Taliban emirate in Afghanistan as a part of this axis of resistance. So there is a closeness there. Iran is also hesitant, though, about this uh, second emirate. Much like Pakistan, Iran also has to deal with Baluch separatists. But while the separatists that Pakistan has to deal with are secular nationalists, Iran is dealing with Sunni and Salafi uh, Baluch militants. And these Baluch militants have been brought into and are affiliated with certain groups of the Taliban, in particular, a subgroup known as the Haqqani Network. And it is the Haqqani Network that captured Kabul. So Iran is also worried about its interests not being represented in the Taliban government, because as of recently, only one commander who's pro-Iran um, has been appointed into the uh, Taliban's cabinet. So though Iran supported the Taliban to confront the Islamic State Khorasan province and also to push the United States and its influence out of the region, there is some uh, hesitancy and apprehension about the new government uh, that the Taliban are creating. And now I'm going to move on to uh, Central Asia. Uh, I'm going to refer to Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan as post-Soviet Central Asian states or former Soviet Central Asian states to distinguish them from Afghanistan, which I frame as part of Central Asia due to, uh, due to the shared history, cultures, uh, peoples, and languages. However, um, unlike Afghanistan, these states were historically colonized by the Russian Empire. And later, uh, after the fall of the Russian Empire, uh, locals in this region took up um, the Bolshevik call for self-determination and wanted to establish their own uh, republic, uh, but were later annexed by uh, the Red Army and, and seized and incorporated into the USSR as Central Asian Soviet republics. Even after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, Russia, as I mentioned last time, has maintained its influence over this region, which we'll talk about a bit more. Uh, aside from um, grouping Afghanistan with Central Asia, other scholars also group Afghanistan as part of South Asia or as different ways of referring to the Middle East. Um, which include things like MENA, which stands for the Middle East and North Africa, or SWANA, which stands for Southwest Asia and North Africa. The use of SWANA is largely to oppose Orientalist understandings of um, the region of North Africa and Southwest Asia, particularly calling it the Middle East. Uh, the reason why Afghanistan can fit into these different um, geographic configurations is because it's always been a global nation uh, with many connections to the wider world uh, being at the center uh, or one center point um, 
between Europe and, and Asia. Uh, Afghanistan is also home to large groups of ethnic Tajiks, Uzbeks, and Turkmen. Uh, despite not bordering Afghanistan, there is also a population of Afghan Kipchaks of Kazakh origin and a small minority of Kyrgyz uh, who live in the Wakhan corridor in the uh, north, far northeast of Afghanistan. And despite the differences we'll soon see, the post-Soviet Central Asian states must contend with Chinese and Russian influences. These two powers are vital for the economy and security of these five nations and balancing their interests is an important part of uh, domestic politics and foreign relations. There are several international organizations, including um, the Russian-led Collective Security Treaty Organization, as well as the Economic Cooperation Organization and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that provide security and economic ties between the Central Asian states and with other countries like China, Iran, and Russia. When the Taliban first rose to power in uh, 1996, the former Soviet Central Asian states refused to recognize their government and took a firm stance locking them out, except for Turkmenistan, which we'll return to later. Uh, this time around, though, the post-Soviet Central Asian states are more divided over their foreign policy approaches. However, there are three positions that they're all taking a, a, a firm line of. Um, the first uh, being, you know, following uh, Russia, uh, the post-Soviet Central Asian states are opposed to accepting Afghan refugees. Um, Russia and these states are saying that Afghan refugees are a security concern to the region and they don't want to jeopardize uh, their relationship with the Taliban Emirate at this point in time. However, Tajikistan initially reported uh, being willing to accept 100,000 refugees, but has since adopted an anti-refugee line like the others. The second position they all say is the fear of the spread of Islamic militants, like the Islamic State of Khorasan province, but also other groups that are Taliban aligned, um, including the Islamic movement, uh, of Uzbekistan or the Ansarullah and other groups like Jund al Khalifa that are using Afghanistan as uh, a base or a stage to spread to the north. The, the fear of Islamic radicalization is a very real concern among Central Asian states. And finally, um, since the former Soviet Central Asian states are landlocked, uh, besides uh, access to the uh, Caspian Sea, uh, they're interested in economic opportunities offered by a so-called stable Afghanistan and access to southern markets like Pakistan and India, as well as the Indian Ocean. I briefly want to talk about the three post-Soviet Central Asian states that share a border with Afghanistan. Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan share a combined border with Afghanistan of over 2,000 kilometers. Border security is a primary concern, uh, especially with prevalent drug trafficking and unmonitored border crossings that occur. Radicalization, as I mentioned before, and cross-border Islamic militant groups like ISKP and IMU have been threats to all three states. Uh, these countries are also really important trading partners for Afghanistan. And while they make a small proportion of Afghanistan's total imports, together, these three states provide uh, over half of Afghanistan's energy needs. And the Taliban's recent refusal to pay for their electricity bills has caused concerns for blackouts in much of Afghanistan. These three states have also pursued various uh, cross-border infrastructure projects, including bridges, pipelines, and railways uh, to make um, trade and economic development easier between, the two, uh, between their nations. Tajikistan uh, has a very uh, unique and interesting history with Afghanistan. Uh, they have shared a long history of cross-border support 
during various armed conflicts. Tajikistan had a civil war of its own uh, between 1992 and 1996, following the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And an ethnic uh, Tajik uh, warlord in Afghanistan, Ahmad Shah Massoud, supported uh, the united Tajik opposition against the Tajikistan government forces. Likewise, uh, following the Taliban's uh, capture of Afghanistan in 1996, the Tajikistan government backed Ahmad Shah Massoud and the United Islamic National Front for the Salvation of Afghanistan, which is also probably referred to as the Northern Alliance, against the Taliban. Uh, Tajikistan, as I mentioned uh, earlier, also provided base of operations for um, Iran to conduct uh, its own support for um, the Afghan resistance against the Taliban. This support against the Taliban has continued. Uh, the Tajikistan government has supported the new National Resistance Front of Afghanistan, led by Ahmad Shah Massoud's son, Ahmad Massoud, uh, Ahmad Massoud and former Vice President of Afghanistan, Amrullah Saleh. The capital of Tajikistan, uh, Dushanbe is also where former president of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, uh, fled to uh, before going further abroad, as well as uh, Masoud Saleh um, after the Taliban seized Kabul and other areas resisting Taliban control. Tajikistan uh, is markedly hostile to the Taliban compared to other former Soviet uh, Central Asian states. Um, one of these reasons is because the Taliban have placed parts of northern Afghanistan under control of Ansarullah, which is an ethnic uh, Tajik militant group led by a commander who fought in the Tajikistan civil war against the Tajikistan government, who has vowed to overthrow the current government in Dushanbe. In response, Dushanbe has been preparing their military uh, for, you know, any uh, conflict that may occur, and they've ex been exchanging harsh words with the new Taliban aberrant in Kabul. Turkmenistan is uh, the opposite in many ways of Tajikistan and its foreign policy towards the Taliban. Usually, uh, Turkmenistan takes a self-isolating and neutral foreign policy, uh, but when it suits it, it uh, can become uh, very biased. So uh, Turkmenistan was one of the states that uh, openly supported the first Taliban emirates while not officially recognizing them when they came to power in 1996. Uh, Turkmenistan uh, worked with the Taliban to approve um, the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India gas pipeline. Uh, and this would have assisted uh, Turkmenistan in its uh, oil and gas reserves reaching uh, India and a broader market through the Indian Ocean. Now that the Taliban has returned, Turkmenistan has embraced it as well. They've sent several delegations and the Taliban has you know, said that they will continue to support the building of the gas pipeline that uh, Turkmenistan uh, is, is funding. Turkmenistan, however, is also threatened by the Islamic State Khorasan province and the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. Uh, however, since Turkmenistan is a very isolationist country, it seldomly uh, has much transparency about uh, the extent of these threats. Uzbekistan is treading a line between Tajikistan as well as Turkmenistan. It has the smallest border, about 150 kilometers with Afghanistan. However, it is one of the most heavily securitized borders in the world. Historically, like Tajikistan, Uzbekistan has supported ethnic Uzbek proxies in Afghanistan, like the general and warlord, Abdul Rashid Dostum. They supported Dostum and the rest of the United Islamic National Front for the Salvation of Afghanistan against the first uh, Taliban emirate. But 
since that and since um, the uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan uh, was formed in 2004, Uzbekistan backed out from regional security groups, including uh, backing out with the United States, and then later backing out of the Collective Security Treaty Organization led by Russia. Uh, though Uzbekistan is very much threatened uh, by the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan and other aligned uh, Islamic militant groups, they have aligned their policy more so with Turkmenistan. Uh, meet, uh, with an Uzbek delegation meeting uh, a Turkmen delegation and agreeing that they were going to work with the new Taliban government. And uh, above all, Uzbekistan is looking forward to doing business and opportunities for trade with the new Taliban regime. Next, we're moving to Kyrgyzstan. Now, Kyrgyzstan is not uh, directly on the border with Afghanistan, and they're taking a more pragmatic approach. Um, Kyrgyzstan's foreign policy has been uh, based on a lot of uh, pragmatism. Uh, between 2002 and 2014, they hosted a US air base until uh, they leased it to uh, Moscow and the Russians. And that's really important because Kyrgyzstan really depends on Russian training and equipment, primarily through the um, Collective Security Treaty Organization. Kyrgyzstan, you know, therefore, uh, following this pragmatic approach, has engaged in dialogue with the Taliban, and they've sent uh, official delegations primarily to um, secure the safety of their embassy. They've also uh, begun sending humanitarian aid to Afghanistan and Kabul. Finally, uh, Kazakhstan is uh, both the largest in land size of the uh, former Soviet Central Asian states, as well as uh, having the largest economy due to its oil and gas reserves. At the same time, this has allowed them to build uh, one of the best militaries in uh, Central Asia. So with this sort of securitization and militarization, they feel less threatened by Taliban rule even though Kazakhstan has had to deal with um, radicalization and Islamic militants as of late, particularly um, Jundel Khalifa and uh, local branches of the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. Kazakhstan, after the fall of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, began hosting the UN assistance mission to Afghanistan in Almaty. Uh, and at the same time, they're taking a pragmatic approach, securing the safety of their embassy and sending delegations to meet with the Taliban, much like Kyrgyzstan. Uh, Kazakh officials have also gone so far as to say that the Taliban pose no threat to security in Central Asia uh, whatsoever. While the United States and NATO-backed Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and the occupation that was required uh, in order to prop it up uh, against the um, Taliban resurgence in 2006 was one type of imperialism. The uh, Taliban's resurgence and the establishment of the second emirate uh, in Afghanistan is a new different form of imperialism supported by various regional actors. You know, the donors of the Taliban desired a friendly government in Afghanistan that opposed the United States and its interests in the region. And in response for this uh, funding and support, uh, countries like China, Iran, Pakistan, and Russia expected certain concessions, particularly access for developing resources, building infrastructure, combating other Islamic militant groups like the Islamic State Horsant province, as well as clamping down on other uh, militant group activities and looking at China, extraditing Uyghur fighters to back to Beijing. 
And these donors also expected officials to be appointed to the new Taliban cabinet that continue to support their interests and ensure that they have influence in the new Taliban government. This is not the case of a decolonial movement or an anti-imperialist movement um, successfully liberating Afghanistan, but the changeover from one imperialist bloc uh, propping up a friendly government to another imperialist bloc propping up a friendly government. And in conclusion, uh, I can't stress enough that the donors of the Taliban who supported them um, in some cases for like Pakistan for several decades uh, are apprehensive about the direction that the new Taliban government is going, especially with the various appointments that have happened. And for different reasons, Iran wants different things out of the new Taliban government than Pakistan or China or Russia. And the future of Taliban affiliated groups in Afghanistan remains uncertain. Different uh, Baloch separatist forces uh, aimed at Iran or Pakistan, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, uh, different Al Qaeda affiliates, as well as the Islamic State Khorasan province, uh, Uyghur. Um, Turkestan Islamic Party separatists are uh, all in Afghanistan and all of these donor states are unsure what tack that the Taliban are going to take towards them. I also want to highlight and focus on the former Soviet Central Asian states and how they are divided. While Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan are taking a pragmatic approach. Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan have very conflicting approaches with Tajikistan being exceptionally hostile, while Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan are taking a much more friendly uh, approach to the new Taliban government. And this is all happening while Afghanistan requires a great deal of financial assistance. Under the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, um, a large part of the government's budget came from foreign assistance. And getting that foreign assistance, and, and the Taliban getting that foreign assistance now definitely relies on them uh, fulfilling, at least in part, the concessions that are expected from the larger powers that supported them financially. And this is as well with a looming financial crisis, as well as a looming energy crisis. Uh, in particular, uh, the energy needed for Kabul comes from Tajikistan. So the conflict between the two is definitely providing uh, a lot of apprehension among Afghans who live in Kabul and um, the eastern and northern parts of Afghanistan. These donor states, uh, China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, Turkmenistan, are also ignoring the looming humanitarian crisis, as well as brushing aside concerns about the Taliban's treatment of ethnic and religious minorities, as well as uh, women, LGBTQ uh, plus Afghans, and other groups who are at risk under this new regime. The crisis uh, in Afghanistan is very much one that was created uh, both by the United States and uh, the Soviet Union's occupations, as well as the funding of the Taliban in order for local powers to create a friendly state. This conflict really wouldn't be occurring uh, if it wasn't for various uh, international blocs competing for influence in Central Asia. Thank you so much uh, for attending these two sessions, and I hope that they helped contextualize the local situation around the conflict in Afghanistan and the crisis that exists there today.